Well, good morning. Thanks for joining us today. Um, we're going to start things off this morning with some music. We're going to sing about God's faithfulness uh, and our ability to put our trust in him. So would you join us in song? Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. He's never let me down. Faithful through generations, so why would he stop now? He won't. He won't. I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. I won't be going under I'm not held by my own strength I built my life on Jesus He's never let me down Faithful in every season Why would He fail now? He won't My firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. He's never let me down.
Have your way in me 
telling us today, I pray that we'd be receptive and open. We give you praise in this place, and we thank you. Amen. Thanks for worshiping with us. Why don't we take just a moment to uh, say hi to some folks around us before we sit down. How's everybody doing this morning? Um, I uh, just want to welcome you to this place uh, today, and uh, thank you for making it out in the snow. Um, and it's spring break around here, and so uh, I don't know if you're like me, but you see all your friends like going down south to warm Caribbean places with their kids, and we're here together. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, oh, okay, all right. We're excited to be here together. So wherever you're watching from online, we're excited to be here. Um, but where, wherever you are watching from online, I just wanna say thanks for joining us. If you're in spring break, uh, let us know in the comments. Uh, let us know where you're watching from. Uh, we love to see that. Um, a couple things about spring break I wanna uh, just, just mention. Uh, today is the last day that you can register for uh, this. It's called Goose Chase. And uh, it's a family scavenger hunt. Doesn't matter what age, but uh, today's the last day you can register. And we just uh, think this is a fun way, if you're stuck in northern Michigan like our family, this is a fun thing that you could do together as a family. So you download the Goose Chase app. I had to read through this earlier because I wasn't quite sure. Uh, you create a profile, and then each day there's different missions that you can do. Um, and the first to complete each mission gets the most points, and then the family with the most points gets a huge prize. I just thought, that's funny. Wait a, a huge, what's a, what's a huge prize? 
So I went and asked John just a second ago, and he said there's like a, a gift certificate box. There's like $50 to max power. There's a $30 gift certificate. There's a bunch of gift certificates to a bunch of different places. So kind of a fun thing that you can do with the family um, over um, spring break, and uh, we think it's fun. Um, spring break, and then Easter is quickly approaching. And so um, I want you to just watch this video. Um, Real quick, the video that I interrupted, I shouldn't have done that, but watch this video, it's kind of just a promo of Easter. Hope is defined as to cherish a desire with anticipation, to want something to happen or be true. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. Don't be alarmed, the angel said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He is risen. He's not here. Jesus said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. So as, as Easter approaches, one of the things that I believe about Easter is it's just this, it's this time. It's the biggest celebration for Christ followers in the year. It's bigger than Christmas, and um, hope is one of the biggest themes uh, in this celebration. And so I just, wanna, I just wanna encourage you, I wanna challenge you to do something. I wanna challenge you to invite someone that you know to our Easter services. There's a Good Friday service. It's at seven o'clock on Friday and then we have two services on Easter, one at nine and one at 11. Um, the 11 o'clock has childcare um, and um, uh, kids ministry. And so um, one of the things we believe, I, I just, I believe everybody needs to hear the Easter message. And, and maybe it's just once a year. Maybe you have a friend that just goes to Easter once a year. But it's like this message of Jesus overcoming death, Jesus overcoming the grave, Jesus overcoming sin and giving hope to the world. I just think that's a message that's, that's as relevant as it's ever been. And, um, and so I just think, you know, we can all do something. We can all invite someone that we know, someone that's plugged into a church, someone that's not, don't invite somebody that's already plugged into a church. If somebody is, if you know somebody that's plugged into a church, don't invite them here. They have a church. If you know somebody that isn't plugged into a church, I would just encourage you to invite them. Somebody who needs to hear the message of hope, invite them to Good Friday and Easter uh, this year. Can you do that for me? Can you do that? Yeah, hope. Um, before we jump in today, I want to uh, take a moment and receive our offering, and, uh, and then we'll jump in. Um, if our ushers could come forward, that'd be amazing. There's different ways you can give on the screen. Um, you know, one of the things we talk about around here so much is uh, just our passion, our desire to see everyone find transformation in Jesus and also um, to be mobilized by him, to be, uh, just join his purpose in the world. And so this is what we believe in as a church. This is what we're about. This is what we give to, serve for. Um, so if you would just pray with me. Um, Lord, we just ask that you give, you, you take what we, what we give today. You multiply it for your purposes. You bless it. And uh, Lord, help this go beyond what we could do ourselves. Uh, Lord, bring hope, like we talk about for Easter, bring hope to the world around us, bring hope to um, our community, bring hope to our neighbors, bring hope to anybody in our path uh, that is just struggling right now through life. Uh, Lord, bless what we give. Lord, and, and be with us as we approach Easter and we celebrate this pinnacle day of the year, um, we ask that you bless that too, in Jesus' name, amen. As the ushers are um, passing the offering, um, we have been in a series called Jesus Revealed. And we've been doing this for a few weeks. Today's the third uh, week we've done this. One of, the, one of the things that you find in Jesus's ministry is that there's these questions that kind of um, come to the surface, questions that people ask Jesus. And, and what, we, what we find is these questions are often super relatable to our experience and the way we view the world around us. But Jesus' answer to these questions 
um, is also telling about who he is, about who God is. And so today, um, we're going to do a, a um, message entitled, Jesse Forster's going to give a message entitled, uh, Do You See Me? And I, I'm going to invite Bryce and Lisa out to sing a song to, to start to get us thinking about this. But I just want you to know, um, this is a story of the woman at the well, and there is, there is a video that we're going to show at the end of this message that has uh, some references to sexual assault. So I want to give a warning. If you're here and that's a sensitive topic to you or you have little ones and, and you just kind of want to guard their ears, um, I just encourage you to do what you need to do. But we talk about healing and we talk about hope around here. And, and, and in order to do those things, sometimes we have to talk about the nitty gritty, like sometimes the hard things of life. And so I just want to give you that warning um, for anybody that is, is listening that just wants to guard your little one's ears or if you had an experience and you're just not ready to hear that. So uh, with that, I'd love for you two to sing a song for us and then we'll jump into uh, today. Thank you. 
Oh, thank you, Lisa and Bryce. That song is so beautiful. I felt just standing backstage there, just having my hands in my heart, feeling those words wash over us. How oh, God knows us. He loves us. Well, welcome. Again, my name is Jesse Forster, and I'm so excited to be with you today as we continue our series of Jesus Revealed. And this series, as Joel said, we've been looking at questions that people who interacted with Jesus during his ministry asked him, and these questions have helped us understand Jesus better. And today we are diving into a story of the woman at the well, and this is a story where it's actually been misunderstood many times before, but the perspective that we're looking at the story today will help us see how God truly saw the woman at the well and how God sees us. But before we dive in, will you pray with me? Father God, I thank you so much for, oh, just your ever presence, Lord, how you are with us now here. You are with us in the joys of our lives. You're with us in the difficult times of our lives. And God, I pray that today as we dive into your word, Lord, that we feel the word that you have for us, God. Let the words that are spoken be of you, God. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So it was 2008. I was freshly out of undergrad, and my parents and I, my mom and dad and I, were headed out to Colorado for an epic road trip for my cousin's wedding. He was marrying this incredible woman named Emily, and we were going out to celebrate with them. But then after the celebration, we decided that we were going to go out and explore the beauty of Colorado. So one day, we, it was a day after the wedding or so, and we had traveled to Durango, Colorado, which if you haven't been there, is this beautiful town tucked up into the mountains. And my dad and I and my mom are sitting at this great restaurant on the outside patio having an incredible dinner, and the dinner is going really well. And then about halfway through the dinner, my mom, who many of you may know, her name's Pat Lang, she attends here, and if you know Pat Lang well, you know that she's not exactly a wallflower. <laughs> she is extraordinarily extroverted. So my mom leans over to us and says, guys, I think over at that table is Emily's uncle from the wedding. So my dad and I look over at a table about 10 feet away from us, and we look and we see a man sitting there, presumably with his wife and daughter. And we turn our heads back to my mom and we emphatically say, that is not Emily's uncle from the wedding. But if you know my mom, she insisted that she was right. So almost as if it's in slow motion, my mom gets up from our table and starts to walk over to this man. And she looks down at him, and he looks up at her with a look of shock and pending doom. And she says, are you Emily's uncle from the wedding? To which he says, no, I am not Emily's uncle from the wedding. <laughs> and out of the corner of my eye, I see in a different table, there's these two kind of burly looking guys in business casual kind of starting to stand up a little bit out of their chairs. But then as my mom walks away, they sit back down, and my mom comes back to us, and she's clearly flustered. And she says, guys, that's not Emily's uncle from the wedding. And we say, yeah, we know. And she goes, that's the Secretary of Homeland Security, Michael Chertoff. <laughs> what? My dad and I are kind of like, I mean, her credibility wasn't great at this point. So we're like, Re what? Really? But the next morning, we heard from some locals that Michael Chertoff was vacationing in Durango, Colorado with his wife and daughter, and those two burly men from the other table were his secret service detail. <laughs> Never a dull moment with Pat Lane, folks. Never a dull moment. But that is an epic family tale. That is an epic case of mistaken identity an epic case of thinking you see one thing when actually you see something completely different, of not maybe seeing someone clearly or making assumptions. And this is so easy to do. We jump to assumptions about people all the time. We forget to get curious. We forget to look beyond the surface of what we are seeing. It's easy to not truly see another person. 
But we also know what it feels like to be on the other side of this. We know what it feels like to feel misunderstood, especially in seasons of grief or loneliness, times when we want people to see us, but all they see is what's on the surface. But below the surface, there is a pain lurking deep. But today we're looking at a story where Jesus takes the time, where Jesus takes the curiosity to show a woman that she's truly known. And this feeling, this knowledge that she is fully seen, it transforms her and it transforms her community. The story is the woman at the well. And this woman goes unnamed in scripture, but we know that she was a Samaritan woman and she encounters Jesus at a well at the high day of noon, noon on a day. And he reveals to her that he knows her background. And this prompts her to ask some deep theological questions. And maybe if you've been to church before or if you were raised in the church, you're familiar with the story of the woman at the well. But today, I believe that God is inviting us to see the story from a different perspective, to consider maybe what we have missed in this story what we have missed about what the story tells us about what God is truly like, about who God really is. Does God see us? So let's dive into the text of the story as it's read in the Gospel of John. I'm going to read this and feel free to follow along with me up on the screens or in your Bibles if you have them. Jesus left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down from the well. (coughs) Excuse me. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. Excuse me, I'm sorry. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. (coughs) Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself? as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. (coughs) Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands, and the man you have now is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. This is a lot of text, and I want us to pause here and and digest it. Thank you, Carl. (laughs) Appreciate it. Oh, I'm okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Carl Steen, everyone. Wonderful. Oh, so let's unpack all of this because there's a lot of context happening in this scripture that's important that we understand. The first is referenced in the text. The text says that the Samaritans and Jewish people did not interact with one another. You see, the Samaritans and the Jews had deeply held religious beliefs, and the Jews would have avoided the Samaritans at all costs. And Jesus' traveling to Samaria was very countercultural for this day. See, most Jewish people who were following the same path that Jesus was following in his journey would have gone around Samaria. But Jesus makes the intentional choice to go through Samaria. Incredibly countercultural. The second important context for this is looking at the historical context for marriage in this time. I don't know about you, but whenever I have read or even been taught about when Jesus tells her her marital history, I've always kind of read it as a gotcha moment. And if we truly understand what happens in the history of marriage at that time, 
what was the actuality is that women had no agency or power to choose who or when they were married. Women or girls were mostly married at the ages of 12 to 15 to much older men. And so it was very common for them to outlive their husbands. And so their families would remarry them because it was an economic benefit to the family. The woman had no ability to divorce on her own, very little on her own. And a man could divorce for no reason. So when we look at this interaction with Jesus and we look at the historical context, it's highly unlikely that this woman was just going from husband to husband. And in actuality, she had probably been abandoned or widowed an extraordinary number of times. And also, there's no call to repentance in this. Jesus, like we learned from Joel last week, Jesus would call people to repent when they had something to repent of, but Jesus does not repent, ask her to repent, and instead engages in this deep theological conversation with her, the longest dialogue recorded. So with the context of this, of marriage, and what's happening with the Samaritans and the Jewish people, instead of a gotcha moment, what I believe God is asking us to consider is that Jesus used his divine knowledge of her circumstances, that he was God, that he knew her story, he knew the deepest parts of her, and that he was intentional that she saw this. That Jesus didn't just see the superficial components of her, but he saw her joy, he saw her pain, he saw her present and her past, and he honored all of these components of her by engaging in this conversation. That maybe Jesus didn't just randomly choose to walk through Samaria on that day, but instead he used his knowledge that Jesus knew that he made the intentional decision, that he made the divine decision to reveal to her that he knew her background, to show her that he is a God that sees. In the Gospel of John, he often uses light as an example of Jesus, as a, as a, as a symbol of who Jesus is. And Jesus is the light, the one true light, and he first reveals this to this woman by illuminating her story to her. And this moment when light touches this woman, she interacts with Jesus. Her eyes are opened and she asks this deep theological question. John records it in verse 19. Immediately after Jesus recounts her history of pain to, to her, the first words out of her mouth are, Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is Jerusalem. Now I'm going to be real with you. I have read this verse many times. It's often been a stumbling block for me, maybe to you too, because for us in our cultural context, this feels like the most random tangent to what he had just revealed to her, and maybe we're even tempted to skip it. But if we pause here and truly engage in the text, we see that this woman is curious because she realizes that Jesus is not just your ordinary Jewish man sitting by the well at the hot day. And she thinks here, this man is a prophet. This man has a connection to God. This man may even speak for God. We can almost see the wheels turning in her head. And so she goes for it. She asks this highly relevant question for her people and for her time. Remember, the Jewish people and the Samaritans, they had deeply held religious differences, and these differences often erupted in violence. And so she asked this incredible, significant question. This woman says, okay, Jesus, okay, you're not an average Joe, so I'm going to go for it. I'm going to go for the hard-hitting question. But there's also something else happening here. When Jesus, when she asked Jesus this question, she's saying, okay, 
prophet, man, I'm not exactly sure who you are, but who really is God? How do we really know who is God? And beyond that, beyond even deeper, beyond the surface, who is God to me? Does God care about me? Does God care what has happened to me? Does God see me? It's like she's saying, Jesus, you've explained the resume of my past to me. You've explained what has happened, but I want to go deeper with you, Jesus. I want to know why there is pain and division in my community. I want to know why there is pain in my own personal life. What is God like? Who is God? Does God see me? This moment is so powerful. She engages in the curiosity that is bubbling up inside of her. She has the vulnerability and the strength to ask the question. You see, when we experience pain in life, whether it is the ordinary pain of just living in this broken world or it's an extraordinary moment of pain, we tend to keep things superficial. How many times has somebody asked you, how are you And your answer is, oh, great, except there's a lot of pain happening underneath the surface. But that person that takes the time to say, no, but really, how are you? And then that moment when all of a sudden you feel this rush of freedom and this safety to express how you really are, your fears and your joys and your pain, all of the layers, the relief of being truly seen washes over you. And then you feel safe to wrestle. You feel safe to get into it, to ask the hard, hitting, deep questions, to reveal that we don't really know everything to reveal that we aren't really sure, but we know that it is safe to ask. And that is what I offer happened with a woman on that day by the well. When Jesus took the time to reveal to her that he truly saw her, she felt safe to ponder. She felt safe to ask the big questions, and the result of her curiosity, the result of her questioning was amazing. See, after she asks this question of where do we uh, worship Jesus, and Jesus gives the answer that soon it's not going to be about where, but about who, and then she says, yes, I know the Messiah is coming, and when he does, he will reveal everything to us. And to this, Jesus says, for the first time recorded in John's gospel, Jesus reveals himself as the Messiah. Then Jesus declared, I The one speaking to you, I am he. This is the first I am statement. This is Jesus saying to her, I am he. This is Jesus saying to her, I am the one that you have been waiting for. Jesus is saying, I am standing right before you. This is so powerful. This moment is the crux of the interaction. You see, this whole interaction between Jesus and And this woman was about one thing. It was about Jesus purposefully and intentionally slowing down, literally to change his route to see this woman, to let her know that she was fully seen, that he saw her. He saw the pain that she was going through. She saw that she was still hurting from the trauma that she had experienced. Jesus wanted her to see that he saw her. It goes more than just seeing the pain that she had experienced. Because that's not just what this woman was. She was not the worst thing that had ever happened to her. She was a full person. She was a full person full of dignity. John describes her in this story as an inquisitive truth seeker. She was curious. She was a full person. So consider this. Jesus revealed to her that he knew her pain, 
so that she knew she was fully seen. And the washing of the freedom of being fully seen gave her the courage to ask the big questions. And Jesus honored her curiosity by revealing his true identity as the Messiah. Are you tracking with me on this? Jesus didn't just want her to know that he knew about her pain. Jesus wanted her to know that he saw her fully and completely, and he honored her, honored all parts of her by making her the first evangelist. That's right. As soon as Jesus says to her, I am he, she's so excited and has such immense gratitude that she leaves her water jug behind and she runs back to her town and she says, come, see a man who has told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And then the whole town comes running back and a little later in verse 39, John writes that many of Samaritans in her town believed that Jesus was the Messiah because of what this woman said. He told me everything I ever did. He sees me. And maybe now this woman was not only known in her town now as someone who had been abandoned an extraordinary number of times, or a woman who had no voice or no power, but now she is the first person in her town to learn of the Messiah. She's the first person to share the good news in her town. The questions that Jesus' presence and knowledge and seeing her evoked in this woman, does God see me, were a key part of her healing a key part of her digging in deeper, of her wonder, of her curiosity, of her wrestling. And on the other side of it, the Messiah is there. The living water is there before her, looking at her, loving her, and engaging with her in this beautiful dialogue. And maybe as you sit here today, or as you watch online Maybe you sit here listening to the story from a different perspective ever before. Maybe there is a pain in your past or even a pain in your present and this pain feels paralyzing. Maybe even you feel physically ill from the pain, from the deep sadness and the brokenness and the fear and you are so afraid of being fully seen because you worry, is that all that you are? I know this feeling. I've been there. I've been in seasons of pain where I was so afraid to let anyone in to really see what I was wrestling with. I was so, I was afraid. I questioned, does God really see all the complexities of the pain? And this was especially too true during a season of infertility that Neil and I went through. And if you're going through infertility right now or you have in the past, I just want to honor that. Because the pain from infertility is not something that just gets better. It's not something that we should brush off. It's something that we should talk about more. But when I was in that season, I felt so alone in my pain. And as the time went on and disappointments compounded on them and all the people that I loved around me were building their families and and moving on and I felt so alone. I felt like I was standing in a crowded room but nobody could really see what was happening beneath the surface. And besides our family, we didn't really share what we were going through because it felt too risky. It felt too risky to be vulnerable about it. We didn't know what people would say. We weren't really looking for advice. And so we remained in the loneliness of it. And there was this one afternoon. It wasn't anything extraordinary that happened that day. It was just an ordinary day. I was putting away laundry in our room. And all of a sudden, this wave of grief just washed over me. Grief of what I wanted so desperately to be and was not yet. And with that came a wave of other emotions, and I just crumbled onto the floor, crying out to God, God, where are you in all of this? 
Where are you? Do you see what we are going through, God? Do you see me? And I continued to wrestle, and the months went by. And a few months later, my husband Neil and I said yes to leading a small group out of our house. And this was the type of small group where we hadn't met the people before. So they were strangers when they came to our house that first day. And the curriculum in the small group invited each person to share something that they were wrestling with at that time. And I felt the very distinct prompt from God to share what we were going through with infertility. And to be honest with you, I was super annoyed. (laughs) I didn't want to share. I didn't want to talk about this stuff to a bunch of strangers. But I listened to the invitation and I shared a small part of what we were going through. And after the meeting was over, this woman came up to me and she said, thank you so much for sharing your story. My husband and I are going through the exact same thing right now. We have an incredibly important appointment tomorrow. I haven't told anybody, not even my family. And I felt so seen by your story. I was shocked. It's even difficult now to put into words the emotions that I felt in that moment. It was like God was bringing two of his daughters together to remind us that we are seen. That God sees us. That God sees the pain that he laments right alongside of us. That God sees us fully for all that we are. That we are never alone in our suffering or our brokenness. That it is safe to wrestle. It is safe to ask the big questions. It is safe to crumble on the floor of your room and to cry out. And when I knew that it was safe, I knew that I was fully seen by God, that his presence was ever so evident. It gave me the courage to not look just in, but out. That it was more than just my pain that God was calling me out, that God was calling me to be brave and to be vulnerable and to share our stories, to openly wrestle with the not yet questions that loomed in my head, that God gave me the courage and the vision to open up and he placed so many people in my path that would say thank you. Thank you for sharing. This is what is happening with us. He still does. And we wrestle We wrestle with the grief. We wrestle with the sadness. We even wrestle with the hope. God sees me and he calls us to see each other. That this is who our God is. That our God is in the business of restoring the brokenness and the pain with his redemptive love. That he is the God who sees. And the woman at the well She needed to know that she was seen. And Jesus went out of his way that she to tell her that she was seen by the living God fully and completely. Do you know that you are seen? Do you know that it is safe to wrestle? Do you know that it is safe to show the pain and the brokenness? That you are full of life and dignity. That God sees all of it in you. That our God's love goes so deep that he goes out of his way to seek you out. That he goes out of his way to tell you you are loved. You are God's creation. That he sees you fully and completely because he made you and he's looking you in the eye saying I am he I am the Messiah I am the living water and I am standing before you you are seen by the son of God and he continues to show up he continues to go out of his way to seek you out to know that you are fully seen and heard and loved Next few minutes, we are going to hear a story from my friend Tatiana. And Tatiana is an incredible woman full of courage and vulnerability. And I am grateful for her wrestling. I'm grateful for her vulnerability to share her story with us. 
And so I invite all of us to honor her courage and her strength and her love for Jesus as we watch her story. Something's been stolen Under the weight of the curse It's been broken When I was 13 years old, I was sexually assaulted. At the time that it happened, I didn't realize that what happened to me was assault, so I carried a lot of shame and blamed myself for not being able to stop it from happening. My peers also heard about what happened and the narrative was that it was my fault, so I believed that it was my fault too. And two years later, I started to think more about that event, about how I said no and my no was not respected, about how I fought and pushed him away from me until I couldn't anymore. And then I began to consider that what happened to me was not consensual. But considering this reality was incredibly painful and isolating. I didn't want it to be true, and I didn't know who I could talk to about this, so I didn't talk to anyone. I felt sick all the time. I was having nightmares reliving the event, and because of that, I was afraid to go to sleep. I couldn't escape my trauma awake or asleep, and I felt completely alone in it. One Sunday morning, I was singing at church on the worship team, and there was a man from out of town who was visiting that weekend, and he came up to me after service to speak to me, and he told me that he had a word of knowledge for me. And words of knowledge were not a common occurrence at the church I was at. And if you're unfamiliar with what it is, it's when someone has a supernatural God-given insight about someone or a situation and they share what they believe they've heard from God. So he asks me if he can share this word of knowledge with me. And I say, sure, not really knowing what exactly to expect. But he says to me, something happened to you when you were younger and your innocence was taken from you. And God wants you to know that he saw what happened and he doesn't blame you. He wants to heal you, restore you, and give you rest. And when he said this to me, I I couldn't believe it. As beautiful as this moment was, and as much as I hold on to that moment with hope, and as much as I felt seen and loved by God in a way that I cannot explain or comprehend, this is actually where my real questioning began. I thought to myself, okay, God, you saw, but why didn't you stop it? If you're a loving father, why didn't you intervene, and why didn't you save me? I went on a long journey of deeply questioning and doubting the goodness of God because God saw me. That question was always there beneath the surface, buried under my pain, and God was actually inviting me to ask it, inviting me in return to see his character more clearly, to see that he did not cause this evil to happen to me, that every act of violence breaks the heart of God, and his heart was broken to see his daughter violated and abused. I felt alone for so long, and slowly I began to share with some trusted people in my life, and Sometimes someone would say to me, something like that happened to me too. And then we would find safety and healing in one another's shared stories. We no longer felt so alone. We had someone who held our stories with grace, gentleness, and understanding. And God bringing those stories to the light meant that we didn't have to hide or feel unseen anymore. Jesus runs after the blow. One of my good friends knew my story and she sent me this song by a group called Common Hymnal that was written to address the pain of sexual violence and to be a source of healing. And I felt so seen by my friend when she sent me 
this song and over the years it's been a refuge for me listening to these lyrics that verbalize so perfectly what it feels like on this healing journey to recognize that Jesus runs after us in our brokenness and in our pain, that he weeps with those who weep. And even that opening line over the years, something's been stolen, has helped me verbalize what it felt like for me that day, that there was something stolen from me that God is ready to restore and heal that part of me. In February of 2020, I was sharing my story in a church service and two women came up to me and told me that what happened to me happened to them too. And they got the courage to tell their life group that night. They didn't have to be alone. They didn't have to feel unseen or have their pain go unnoticed. They could be seen and cared for by God through their community. Because God saw me in my pain and invited me to ask him the hardest question that I was too afraid to address. Beauty, redemption, healing, and purpose has come out of the most evil thing that has happened to me. I learned to see God clearly, to see his goodness in the midst of brokenness, his kindness and gentleness in the way that he brought people alongside of me to heal me. And now I'm more confident than ever that God's character remains the same regardless of our circumstances. And the woman at the well asks her hard question of Jesus. And Jesus' ultimate response is to reveal himself to her as the Messiah, her savior, her redeemer, the God who sees her. So when we question, does God see me? We see here that God's answer is that he does see us. He knows the hurt we carry and cares for us deeply in our hurt. And in that is an invitation to see and know him in return. And I think what's so interesting about this woman's response to being vulnerably seen by God is that this brings up the hard questions for her. She realizes that there is something different about this man she's speaking to and her question is, so tell me why, explain. There's this pain of division in my community. There's pain in my life that you've alluded to. So tell me why. Who is right or wrong about God? What is God like? Her pain being seen actually brings up more questions for her to ask of Jesus. I think sometimes when we sit alone in our pain for a while and we realize that God sees us and is with us there, it doesn't always take our questions or hurts away, but can amplify them and compel us to wrestle with those questions more deeply. But then as she continues to talk to Jesus, he reveals himself to her as the Messiah, the savior she's been longing for, for her and her people. And her response is then to go tell her whole town about him and invite them to come experience what she has come and see. Come and see the man who told me everything. And the greatest part of my healing journey was not when the nightmares stopped, when I didn't feel sick anymore, or even when the word of knowledge was shared and I felt the assurance that God didn't blame me for my trauma. Every time I share my story and someone because of that finds a safe space to share theirs, I'm healed a little bit more. The redemption, beauty, and goodness I've experienced and that God has brought out of my pain has far outweighed the bad. Because Jesus saw me in my shame and told me it wasn't mine to carry. He lovingly sat with me as I questioned and I know that all the times that I've wept over what was stolen from me that day, he's wept with me too. I've come a long way in my healing, but at the same time, I know that I won't be healed fully until I see Jesus face to face. There are still days where grief hits me hard. There are still days that I wake up after a nightmare. There's still days that I'm just having a harder day coping, and in those days I know that Jesus still takes the time to be with me there, and he's still patient with my healing. Shattering Jesus
safe with you. I'm gonna make it through. Rain came with blue, but my house was built on you. I say with you, I'm gonna make it through. Rain came with blue, my house was built on you, and I'm safe. I'm gonna make it through. I'm standing strong on you. Yeah, I'm gonna make it through. Cause my house was built on you. so grateful for Tatiana sharing her story and her vulnerability. And what Tatiana's story shows us is that God is racing after us. That we are not alone in the brokenness or the pain or the shame that we might feel, but God is saying, no, let me take that from you. God is saying it is safe to wrestle with the questions of the whys and the whos, that God and Jesus is there with us, wrestling with us on the floor of our rooms, holding us. And this is a place where it is safe to wrestle, that we come together as a community, not being alone in the pain, not just living on the surface, but we are deep in community with one another. And so I'm going to encourage all of you to pull out your phones right now because Tatiana's story is not an uncommon one, unfortunately. We all have either experienced the ramifications of sexual violence or maybe we know of somebody or we will meet somebody. And there is an incredible organization that has a 24-hour hotline and a tip line that if you are in crisis, you can access the information from this. There'll be a QR code that will come up in a minute. But also, I encourage you to come down for prayer. Our prayer team will be here. I will be here. Or contact us later. Later in the week, if something hits you, whatever it is, know that this is a safe place to come and wrestle. Thank you so much for being here today. I hope that you all have a very blessed week. And we will see you next Sunday for continuing our series, Jesus Revealed.